This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. Today I am joined by Dr. Eric Brewer. Dr. Brewer is a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley, and the VP of Infrastructure at Google. He earned his doctoral degree in computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research interests include scalable servers, search engines, network infrastructure, distributed systems, and security. Dr. Brewer is the former founder and chief scientist of Inktomi Corporation. He has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering and is a past recipient of the ACM Infosys Foundation Award. Germain, to today's show, he is widely known as the discoverer of the CAP theorem, which has had a profound influence on subsequent work in the field of distributed systems and databases. Dr. Burr, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you so much. Glad to join you. Would you like to say anything about your background that I didn't cover? Well, that was uh, pretty fun. I would say the only thing I would add is I spent a lot of time historically in developing countries trying to figure out how to use technology to improve the quality of life. And that's been a lot of fun also, but totally different than working on distributed databases and cloud computing. Great. Well, today you and I will be talking about the CAP theorem. The original motivation for this show was a paper you wrote a few years ago called CAP at 12. I'm going to start out talking about the early days of the theorem, and then in the second part of the interview, we'll talk about how things have changed and evolved. To start out, what sort of problems were you working on when you had this insight, which became the CAP theorem, and and why did that set of issues emerge at that time? I think it stems from a shift to a focus on availability. And I appreciated the focus at the time, but I didn't fully understand its consequences. And what I mean by this is pre-internet, a big database system typically got to go on maintenance mode at night. If you had a banking database, you would basically do all your uh, batch processing at night to do auditing records, generate reports, and none of that was a live service. And so I want to distinguish things you can do kind of anytime you want, which I generally think of as batch computing, and things that have to be done right now and are visible externally, which I think of as live services. So with the Internet, we started to see a lot more live services, and that actually starts that shift. Did you see the CAP theorem as an original insight, or was it more of a a clear conceptual formulation of something that most people sort of knew intuitively who worked with those type of systems but hadn't clearly delineated it? That is a very tricky question, and I thought about it a lot. I would say it was an original insight to me, but I wasn't the first to have it. I think I was the first to have it in the way that it's expressed now, perhaps. What I mean by that is that insight about availability is in the literature in a few different places, although not in the database communities, typically in the networking literature. And I I know several networking researchers that have sent me comments that, you know, I kind of said this in 1987 or whatever, and I I agree with them. They did say it, but not in the language of distributed databases and not to that audience. And uh, that's pretty typical, I think, as fields mature and merge, that you get some cross-fertilization. This is reminding me of a book I read recently in which a researcher pulled together insights from many different fields, and his comment was, it's all out there, but no one reads each other's journals. I think that's fair. And if you look at the networking literature from the 80s that contains this stuff, it's not talking about the same set of issues, even though the core idea is very similar. Mm. Would you tell us, at the time you proposed this as a conjecture, how did you understand it, the the CAP theorem? I first understood it 
kind of loosely, which was we were definitely making trade-offs that favored availability over consistency. And those were the right trade-offs, and I have actually spoken about this particular topic a lot and come back to it, but roughly availability tends to correspond with revenue, and therefore it's a better choice than people might expect. And so we were making such choices at Inc. to Me in particular, and I was also teaching at the same time, so I started to uh, teach some of these ideas in my graduate operating systems class, and I had one particular day in 1998 where it kind of gelled, and the next day I gave the lecture using CAP as the acronym in the lecture. Uh, and that was actually the first time I, I talked about it. Or maybe it, was, it might have been 97th, actually, sorry. And what was the reception when you proposed this at the conference, the PDOC conference? Uh, PodC was nice enough to invite me to give their keynote. And they weren't expecting me to talk about CAP. They were actually looking for kind of a practitioner that was building interesting large-scale systems. Uh, but I had been thinking about this for, at that point a couple years, and I knew that the Potsy community, which I have deep respect for, and it has many skills that I don't have, wasn't seeing it the same way I was. So I knew immediately when I got the invite what I was going to talk about, uh, although I actually talked about three or four topics in that keynote, and some of them I think are actually also interesting, but that's obviously the cap is the one that got the attention. And it had a pretty immediate reaction in the audience that this is something they were intrigued by and really cared about. If you look up the CAP theorem in Wikipedia or a basic presentation, it's presented as the two out of three properties from C, A, and P. Could you talk to describe that, uh, what that means? And um... That was the original way I chose to present it for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think it's still a useful way to get into the topic. Uh, and so what it means is basically there's three things you'd like to have. You'd really like to have the data is consistent across replicas. You'd like to have that the system is available. And you'd like to have that if you happen to have a partition in your network, uh, things don't go too badly. And that formulation says you can't have all three. You have to pick at most two. And I understood, actually, in the, even in the pod C talk where I give that formulation, I say it's actually more complicated than that, and there's a spectrum of choices you can make. But that wasn't the news. The news was two out of three, and that's why I think that was the right focus for the time. And so I, I think given people weren't ready to hear it, honestly, that was the reason to present it in that kind of stark choice manner. Yeah, I understand that two out of three people have found a lot more nuance in that in the intervening years, and I'd like to come back to that. But for the moment, I actually disagree think, with that slightly. I'd like to say the nuance was always there, and it's even in the pod seat talk. It's that you have to get over the the two out of three first before you can understand and dig into the nuance. I see. So you see it more. It's a a progression in a person's understanding that they first have to grasp. Uh, the most simplistic or binary version of the theorem, and then they can start understanding more the analog version. I would agree with that. And I would say it's true, not just individually, but more importantly, as a community. Sure. And that's often the case with new ideas. So let's focus for a little bit on this, what I'm calling the binary version of the theorem, which tells us there are three types of systems, the CP, AP, and AC. Although in some reading about this, there are people who say they're really only two. It's the consistent or the available system. But let's start with the idea of three systems. Could you tell us what are those three types of systems and give an example of each one? Sure. The classic example of AP, meaning it's highly available and purpose consistency, is essentially the Internet. And you see this all the time with stale web pages or stale DNS entries. And so it's, it's inherent in the Internet. And in general, I would say in networking, uh, because of partitions that, and things like caching and uh, distant replication uh, that's not consistent, it's always very AP in flavor. Databases with ACID were classically focused on C and would typically forfeit availability. And... Um, may or may not actually tolerate partitions. That's, they, you don't actually, you're not guaranteed you get all three, by the way. There's lots of systems that only have one, and in fact, lots of systems don't have any. But the best you can do is, for databases, especially the classic ACID transactions, 
Uh, acid itself, uh, at least with the reads and writes, requires consistency. And so if you have partitions, it means databases can't be highly available. And that was really the most controversial part of it at the time, which is to say that uh, database vendors that are claiming perfect availability probably aren't particularly accurate. And I remember having public discussions in conferences about this very point, and I can dig into some of those. But in general, databases do have windows where they can lose data if the network is partitioned. Let's follow on that point. That how did the database world respond when you propose that there's a limit on what they can ever accomplish with a distributed database? I think the first action was generally that I was simply wrong. And then the second reaction was I was had a very narrow, the amount of consistency they had to give up was very little. So let's dig into that part a little bit. So the classic way that this comes up for databases is you have a primary and a backup. And if you partition between the two, the backup is either going to be inconsistent or if you want it to be consistent, then you have to take down the whole system. And different databases will make different choices. But the ones that claimed availability would essentially allow the primary to fall behind, right? Figuring the network partition is going to be temporary. When it closes, we will bring the backup back into up-to-date status. But the fact is, if the backup is a snapshot, then it is inconsistent. And so you have to kind of pick your poison there. And, in fact, you will lose data if your primary goes down and your backup is, is stale. In looking at subsequent work in database in which the CAP theorem has had a huge impact, I see things now that the database field has embraced CAP and databases try to be explicit about where they position themselves on the triangle and to be as good as they can at their particular trade-off that they make. Is, is that a fair statement? I think that is a fair statement. In fact, I would say that the most beneficial thing of the CAP theorem coming out was really that it opened up a thousand different database projects, right? So they're not all good, but I love the fact that people are exploring the whole space. I think that's super healthy and lots of good systems have come from that. We had Michael Stonebreaker on a previous show talking about a paper he'd written called The End of One Size Fits All in the Database World. He was talking about many different aspects, but a lot of it focused on the type of data you're storing. Yep. I believe the cap is, or this development we're talking about, it is uh, another dimension of the end of one size fits all in terms of the availability or consistency trade-off that a system makes. And there, to some extent, those pieces are uh, independent variables. I do think as you get to the more nuanced aspects, you will find that depending on exactly what you want to do with data in the kind of generic data management system, you will definitely find that there are uh, lots of interesting trade-offs to make and lots of optimizations you can make. The title of your pod C talk, I'm going to pronounce that correctly this time, was Toward Robust Distributed Systems. How was CAP a contribution toward that goal? I think that I was trying to get a little bit more clarity on a few topics that I thought weren't handled well in general by distributed systems communities. And certainly CAP was part of that. But I, I do think that the purpose of CAP is to make you think about these trade-offs explicitly early in your design. And that's what makes your system more robust. So could you give an example of uh, a system where that thought process would result in a more robust end product? Oh, I think lots of people are doing it now, but I would say, for example, uh, I talk about you really want to think about what happens on a timeout. You know, you're trying to do something, operation didn't happen, you haven't heard back whether it was successful or, or, or not, and that is kind of the moment of truth for CAP. You have to actually decide, am I going to continue to try again to complete that operation, which is typically what you need to do for consistency, or am I going to give up and forfeit availability, or am I going to escalate to the user and say, I can't make progress right now, what do you want to do? And most people don't think that carefully about their timeouts, either how to set them or what it really means when they can't complete an action. 
Yes, and one of the themes in reading I've done is around the area of timeouts. And how does a client distinguish between a timeout and a network partition, or is that a meaningful distinction? That is a very tricky question. A lot of people believe you can't actually reliably detect a network partition. I would say it often doesn't matter. What matters is is the expiration of the timeout for whatever reason. Right? There's really, you are unable to complete the operations you wanted for consistency, and now you need to decide whether to delay, right, or whether to give up, which means you're forfeiting consistency typically. And if you delay, you may be delaying forever, in which case you're unavailable. And it doesn't really matter if it's for a partition or not. Partition will cause that to happen for sure, but it's not the only cause. So is a partition really a property of the system as a whole, or does each client have its own view of whether it's in contact with the rest of the system or isolated? I tend to view it more the latter, and I'll give you some examples that are interesting. Sometimes you can actually pass data for consistency via the client. So if a client contacts one server, you can put stuff in, say, a cookie, and later that client will give that cookie to another server. And that actually, you can ask, are those two servers partitioned or not? if they can't communicate. Well, they are communicating via the client. And so there are actually some cases where that via client networking is actually a good solution. And I don't see it that much, but I do see it some. The advantage it has from a design perspective is that the client sees kind of the right thing, meaning that if the client can't tell if you have a partition, then maybe it doesn't matter. Right. So in this case, we know whatever the client sees, the other server will be aware of that. And so you'll at least be consistent for that client. We are mostly familiar with the term ACID from database systems. I think our listeners are very familiar with that. You coined the term BASE in contrast to ACID systems. What does that stand for, and what, what type of a system is a BASE system? So this was done a little bit before CAP, but in the same era of trying to understand highly available systems and how they differ from strongly consistent systems. And again, with the push on the internet, again, we were building some of the very first giant scale 24 seven systems. And so that really put a lot of emphasis on availability. Now, BASE isn't very much a, a kind of tongue-in-cheek acronym to complement ACID, and I picked it for a couple reasons. So first of all, it stands for is kind of silly. So base is basically available, soft state, eventually consistent. It's kind of the properties you get when you choose availability over consistency, although I didn't say it exactly that way at the time, but that was kind of the rough reasoning. And is intentionally picked to be the opposite of ACID, and also is intentionally picked to imply a spectrum, just like there's a pH spectrum from acid to base, there is a consistency availability spectrum from acid to base. Now, I pick, took a lot of flack for that as an acronym because it's, it's definitely strained, but I would point out that acid is somewhat strained as well, and in fact, it's now sacred, but it, even in the early days, Jim Gray and I talked about this, it's, it's, it's a bit of a stretch in places too. There's some overlap in what the letters mean, they've never you know, sometimes people disagree on exactly what they mean. Uh, and he even claimed, I believe, in his Turing Award talk that, it, you know, that acronym came from, a, you know, a hot tub session. So there are, I would actually say they're equally serious, uh, which is to say neither one was taken that seriously at the time. I think people are willing to give up a lot for a catchy acronym. Yes, I, I'm guilty of that. In your talk, you said most real systems are a mix of acid and base. Can you explain that? Well, just like Stonebreaker now says, there's, you know, one size doesn't fit all. When you're building a, a real system, you actually have many different components. I mean, you actually want to decide on your consistency availability trade-offs separately for each component. So you might want it to be that things that track personal information are extra consistent or, you know, records for billing are consistent. But you might say things that are user-facing, but maybe they ought to uh, choose availability. And so you can you can actually mix these. In fact, eBay, which was an early adopter of cap and base thinking, did a, a very nice job with this in terms of having their relatively complex site divided into many different components, some of which were classic databases and some of which were much more Internet style services. And they mixed them right on the same page. And they you could have situations where most of the page was up, but certain parts of the page weren't working because those were strongly consistent parts that were temporarily unavailable. 
the architect that needs to go through every service or piece of data that goes into the end result and think about what's the right level of consistency in each case. I, I think that's right. And you do it for performance, too. Typically, the systems that choose availability are often also choosing performance and latency by things like extensive caching. When you're ever doing extensive caching, you, by definition, are saying it's not going to be consistent. We'll have some timeout or some window of inconsistency, and that is usually just fine, right? Google does the same thing. eBay does the same thing. These are fine choices, but it's, it's also a performance issue, not just consistency versus availability. So we've been talking about this. I think I want to make it a bit more explicit. The term eventual consistency, is there any, anything else? The term eventual consistency, could you give a definition of that? And The, the intended yeah, meaning is that you can become inconsistent temporarily, typically during a network partition, but it can happen for other reasons. Uh, and that the hope is that when you reconnect, you'll have enough data to reconstruct what the right end state is. This is a property of the A system because of the C system, it's consistent at the time you do a write. So you're saying a A system, it's not completely out of date forever. It takes a little while, but eventually it will catch up. As a design goal, if you're choosing availability, since we think partitions should be rare and relatively short, the best you can do, which is quite good, is to say it will be eventually consistent, meaning when I get connectivity restored, I'm going to ensure it's consistent at that point. And it will then stay consistent as long as I'm not partitioned, which could well be most of the time. I found a very interesting discussion. I think this was in your later paper, which we'll get to in a moment, about the idea of offline or disconnected as a form of available system where let's say the ATM is disconnected from the ATM network and it could be disconnected for uh, a while or the Git version control system where you might be on an airplane that doesn't have internet. I found that a very interesting part of the design space. Could you talk about that the idea of disconnected function as an example of the theorem? Yeah, and it actually, it's an important example because it is when I was teaching one of the examples that led me to the CAP theorem. In fact, some of the papers I was teaching at that time, things like the CODA file system, which is a disconnected file system made for, so when you had your laptop on a plane, you could work on your files locally and then sync them up when you get back. And there are other systems, another famous one called Bayou that had a kind of propagation model to restore consistency. And so these were examples where they were choosing A and then trying to provide eventual consistency by fixing it up. And one hallmark of all these systems is they cannot guarantee to always be able to fix it up. For example, in Git, you mentioned, in version control in general, it's not guaranteed that all your merges will work. Occasionally, you'll get conflicts that you have to fix by hand. And that's exactly the place where availability prevented consistency. And that would be true of any highly available system. Is that not the case? It is not the case for very interesting reasons that are, I think, really the where we are in the most modern part of the research, which is when can you have consistency and availability, right? What are the limits? And I'll give you the general answer, which is it, you can do pretty well with consistency and disconnect operation if you have only local invariants meaning you don't have any global names or global properties. Those are the ones that break when you lose connectivity. So in general, yes, an available system uh, that wants to have, you know, strongly consistent global data is going to have to do repairs upon reconnection. But you could say maybe I don't need strongly consistent data uh, for my particular application, and I would certainly, I think that space needs more exploration. So would this be, an example of this be if something like Git, if I was willing to check in files with version conflicts and leave the unresolved version conflicts in the file, and that was an acceptable file to me? That would be a good example because there are no global invariants in that example. And, in fact, if you squint, actually a lot of systems do that. The first one I saw that did that was actually the, uh, the Palm Pilot contact manager, where if you merge contacts from multiple Palm Pilots, it would just keep all the duplicates. And you had to go through by hand and merge them. Exactly this opens the up. Behavior. Pardon me. 
This opens up another area of the design space, which is how does a system cope with reconciliation on recovery from a partition? And that's one of the things I wanted to push on in the 12-year the, the paper, because I really felt that wasn't being discussed enough, and I really feel like that is what an architect ought to do if they want to really get the nuanced behavior out of CAP, which is you actually have to think about your timeouts, think about your partitions, and in particular, the hardest part is partition recovery, meaning now that we've closed the partition and I can communicate well, how do I restore consistency? And I gave some general guidance for that, but I actually think that there's uh, a, that's an area of active work, and it's very interesting. I want to switch into covering this paper. And since we're talking about partition reconciliation and recovery, let's keep going in that direction. What are some of the interesting developments in that area that you just referred to? Well, let's see. So there was, there's been a couple. There's been work at Berkeley by Joe Hellerstein and his group on monotonic systems. And what that means essentially is if the value of a variable only goes in one direction, then it's easy to reconcile it because when you merge them, you can take the, the higher of the two values. And so that's a constrained system, but it actually works for lots of things. And in fact, um, it's a generalization of something Amazon famously did with their shopping cart, which was if you have two versions of the shopping cart due to a partition, when you merge them, you can basically just take the union, meaning that if an item was deleted on one side and not on the other, when you merge them, you just put them all back. And it does mean that you've forgotten that an item was deleted, but you know, it's not, that's not that big an error and the user can delete it again if they want to. And by the way, being Machiavellian, it's actually better to have too many items in the shopping cart than too few. I think the user would probably want that if they had to make a choice. I think they would. I don't, I'm not criticizing Amazon's choice. I think it's a very reasonable choice. But that union operation is the kind of general thing that you can do when you merge sets post reconciliation or post partition. Thinking about the monotonic case, if you had a bank in which you could only make deposits, you could take the sum of all the deposits that occurred on both sides of the partition. And generalizing that, you, if your operations are commutative and associative, you can always take your set of operations from both sides and merge them and have it work out. The problem with banking is that uh, they're not commutative because even though it's only plus and minus, the minus has the bounds check, and that makes it not commutative. Uh, but that's, that's exactly the interesting case for the ATM. So the ATM, if it's disconnected and you want to withdraw $100, it has to decide whether to do that or not, and it, it might uh, create a negative balance if it had the full state. Yes, and so the way the bank handles that, which I think is a beautiful example of the nuanced version of CAP, is in general, I'll let you go deposit some amount while I'm disconnected. Let's put a maximum on it, say it's 200 or $500. That means that at most, at least per ATM, you could overdraft by $500. And the bank has to decide, is that good or bad? And I would say the answer is it's good because in general, you've had all those ATMs be available rather than unavailable, so they've made more money. And in practice, you have long-lived relationships with these customers, and even if they're overdrafted now, that will probably get resolved, and you'll probably charge them a penalty and actually come out ahead. Just now when you said deposit, did you mean withdraw? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, if you if you overwithdraw, chances are in the long term you will make deposits, and this will actually be fine. And the bank right. will charge you an overdraft fee on top of it just for their trouble. This example you're giving now, you're talking about the design of compensating transactions to, to deal with conflicts that occur. Gregor Hopi has has written about this in a different context, that as long as you have compensating transactions that you can do, then consistency is not necessarily so much of a problem. W would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree with that. I would say that's actually how the real world works, that in general, you know, the check is in the mail. We do not have consistent information. What we have is audit records and we have compensation. Yes. So uh, I'm going to wrap up this thread We've been talking about ideas that came out of this paper, the cap at 12. By my calculation, we're now at 17. So cap is going into its teenage years. I'd like to get your opinion. What primarily has changed in either your understanding or the community at large in the time since you first proposed this? 
Well, I think the most important thing, as I said, is is the exploration of the full space. And that is wonderful because you weren't really exploring much of the space before. And again, there's there's more database projects than there have ever been by a large amount. And that's healthy. I think that a lot of good stuff is going to come out of that. And a lot of learning is going on, both individually and as communities. So all that has been great. I would say these more nuanced things that we're talking about now, like how do you really get eventual consistency and what do you do to reconcile things and how do you do compensation? Those are, I think, still pretty open and very interesting. And then this last one is what kinds of invariants can you have on your data? This is work by uh, Peter Bayless, among others at Berkeley, such that, you know, you can do transactions and still get um, good performance and reasonable tolerance to problems, and that has to do with you know, weakening what you expect out of consistency a little bit, but it's how much you have to weaken is, is very interesting. Could you give an example of, of how consistency could be weakened and what type of invariant could still hold in, in that case? Well, in, in general, you want invariants to be local, meaning that the data you happen to have on your side, if you can keep invariants to be just relative to that, then you can make progress. The th things that hurt you are global invariants, like, for example, I want to have a unique number. Well, you can kind of work on that. For example, you might say that every server is given a range to allocate from, and therefore guarantees that servers would never allocate the same number, and, there, and then you have an invariant that's local, meaning that I can always allocate a number because I know, no matter whether I'm connected or not, that no one else can allocate that number. So there's lots of small techniques we have, but I would say the subtle thing here is that when you have a consistent system, you don't really need to know what your invariants are. And that's a great crutch. And this is, I think, a, under, a, well, a misunderstood thing is really what I want to say, meaning that people think consistency is great, but I actually think they, they don't realize the real reason it's great. And the real reason it's great is that for the invariants you don't know in a consistent system, they tend to work. If you choose availability, you have to be much more explicit about your invariants and think about them carefully, and that's hard work. I think it's worth it, and it's what great architects should do, but it is more work than kind of inheriting consistency from your underlying system and not having to think about it. Conversely, for end users, consistency is the preferred model, exactly because it kind of does what they expect. There are no surprises. In your original paper, you said people love acid and don't like to give it up. Is that what you meant by this statement? I would say it was even a stronger feeling at the time, meaning that, that acid was deservedly so at a triumphant uh, victory over data in some sense. It, you know, the transactional model and, and Jim Gray and his Turing Award very well deserved. Uh, that is something special. And it was the way to approach data management. And so to say, well, you might want to think about availability and even forfeit consistency, that was at least at the beginning not well received. Although Jim Gray himself had no problem with it, for the record. He and I talked about it many times. To back up a minute, the idea of giving out a range of values, for example, you give a server the range 1 to 10, and say so you can create account numbers in that range 1 to 10. The next server can create account numbers 2 to 20. So the servers could individually continue to create new accounts and assign them numbers, and you're guaranteed to be able to merge. It's basically what we do for MAC addresses. Every vendor that makes an Ethernet card is pre-given a range of MAC addresses they're allowed to use, and therefore we never have any conflicts on MAC addresses. So I could imagine an attack on an ATM where let's take this ATM offline uh, and then withdraw $200 from a thousand different accounts. So would the, another example of this invariant be a limit on the total withdrawals that a single ATM node could make while it was disconnected? Well, it has two natural limits already, but yes, that would be a reasonable invariant also. The natural limit is it actually doesn't have that much cash. If you lost all the cash in the ATM, you'd be bummed, but it wouldn't bankrupt the bank. The second natural limit is it can only dispense cash for users whose credential it happens to know, meaning that that card has been in that machine before, probably, and there aren't that many users. And a, a adversarial user is even less likely to be in that list. I guess they could, they could – I take that back. An adversarial user that's clever – could make sure that they have their credentials in many different ATMs from the same bank, take them all offline, get $200 for each of them, 
and kind of like check kiting, uh, avoid consistency for a while. And in both check kiting case and this ATM example, the bank will figure it out when they reconcile their partition and the crook has to be gone by then. But a very risky endeavor indeed. Yeah. So we've been talking about compensating transactions, how systems deal with conflict and conflict resolution and exploring the full space. The cap theorem, are there any other major influences in the 17 years that we haven't discussed? Sure. I would say several people uh, have talked about the performance issues, uh, Daniel Abadi among them, and I agree with his assessment. It's in the 12-year paper also, meaning that many times architects are choosing the properties that, that go with availability, but they're choosing them more for latency reasons than for availability reasons. If you use a lot of caching, you're often doing it for performance, not for availability. But the net effect is the same, that you are risking consistency. So the latency aspect is a legitimate part of the thing. And, again, I think that's a that's a good and more modern interpretation, and I, I fully supportive of that view. Is there a way you could restate the CAP theorem to make latency appear as part of the formulation? Uh, well, Daniel Body actually made a six-letter acronym, which I can't quite remember, that included latency. Um, but the idea is that the system behaves somewhat differently, whether it's partitioned or not. And this kind of gets back to one of your original questions, which is uh, I claim that there are three valid systems, including the ones that don't have partitions, and, and many practitioners say that's not true. You have to choose between C and A. And the distinction is people that view it, you're choosing between C and A say that because they believe partitions are are unavoidable. And I think for a distributed system, that is true. But CAP actually applies to non-distributed systems as well. And in fact, the classic example of something that would be AC, of which there are not many things, is really kind of an enterprise database that you know, is inside a LAN, has a very low chance of partition. Is the chance zero? No. That doesn't mean that um, it uh, can't tolerate partitions, even though that's literally true. When you get to things that are v super unlikely, like a partition in a LAN, especially a LAN with multipath, the reason I don't view that as that big a case is because in those cases, your probabilities are now lower than the probability of the system not working for other reasons, such as software problems. So it has to do with if you bet on A and C both, is the probability of system failing do more to a partition, in which case you made a mistake, or is it do more to uh, software problems, in which case I think the partition is irrelevant. But for distributed systems, partitions are something you can't avoid. I had understood the AC distributed system to be something like a sharded database where e with no replication, so each shard could continue to take writes even if it can't communicate with the other shards. Is is my understanding of that correct? That's actually an example of something that depends on whether you have only local invariants. So if you have shards with no replication and only local invariants, for example, there's no constraint that you don't have duplicates, then you can make a system like that. It'll still lose availability because if you lose one of those nodes, you lose availability for those keys. Uh, not right. for other keys. But if you have any global invariance on that data, then you lose consistency. Okay. Um, so I'd like to wrap up my last real serious question. Where do you see the future of distributed systems and databases going in the next coming years? Well, I think we have another five, maybe ten years of kind of new systems and exploration um, and then it'll probably dwindle a bit, at least for a while. I don't know. Maybe it's, yeah, it's probably at least 10 years. We have 10 years more of distributed databases being a hot topic to go. When it would settle down depends really on, you know, a, a few good implementations covering most of the space. This is kind of what happened even in the database space prior to CAP. Had it settled on ACID, there was consolidation in the space, actually, in terms of the number of players. Um, I wouldn't say the field had, had stalled, but the researchers had moved on to kind of other things. And I think the same thing will happen once we get through this wave of understanding global and local invariants and building artifacts in parallel. Some of those artifacts will be great. It's hard to know which ones. Um, also, I think the cloud is going to be a big practical effect here, that down the road – 
there isn't that much reason to have a million databases. I think there will be a small number of winners, some open source, some not, and then services you can use on cloud providers that actually give you those properties, and then you don't need to write them yourselves. It will become more formalized in the way I can go on the Amazon cloud now and click a button and have a MySQL or an Oracle server, or uh, I can have it backed up or hot standby and, it's gotten to a matter of anyone who can point and click can have whatever range of properties they want. Yeah, so that, that is a different kind of consolidation, but roughly most programmers will end up not working on state management because it's something they get from their framework. Most of the databases that have come out in recent years have emerged from industry in contrast to the ACID world, which was more dominated by commercial products. Do you uh, have any thoughts on that, either why it is or whether that will continue? Well, I think we're still in the stage, although a little bit decreasing, where a small group can write an interesting system and make interesting choices about how they want to manage data. And, you know, the nature of open source, the nature of uh, cloud giving people lots of resources to play with means you can actually build and test pretty big scale systems on your own in a way that wasn't possible 10 years ago. So I think we're in a fertile time for exploration in general, but certainly for data management systems. But I think, again, at some point, those do end up needing to be commercialized because they need support contracts, they need maintenance, they need documentation, and they're not that easy to build. And so as with the database industry in general, there will continue to be commercialization of a variety of systems because that's actually what those systems need to do to have impact. I have a Google question, and you can either take this or not, uh, depending on if you feel appropriate. A lot of the open source databases have come out of some of the big tech companies like Facebook and LinkedIn. Then you have examples of companies like Amazon, which has had a huge influence on databases through their Dynamo research paper, but mainly by people taking the ideas and building their own version of it. And Google, in the same way that Hadoop and some other databases, I think HBase, were an attempt to, to build a product according to a Google research paper. Do you see that split continuing between the open source world and certain companies keeping stuff proprietary and maybe disclosing how they did it but not releasing the technology? I think we'll continue to see a mix. You know, Google, ironically, doesn't really use MapReduce much anymore internally. We have newer systems that have replaced it, and uh, I'll actually be talking about some of those in an upcoming keynote. But in general, it's important to do some publication, but it's not – you know, as it's always been, the publications don't always contain all the secrets, and they also don't always contain the latest stuff. But they're still useful for lots of reasons. And uh, it also is very useful to get many groups looking at these things and, and building systems. That's all great. We'd love to have you come back on and talk about some of the cool new stuff at Google after you give your keynote. Uh, so. That is certainly a possibility. Okay. Let's wrap up. If listeners would like to follow you or your research, where is the best place to go? That's a good question. There is no great place to go. I'm not hard to find online, obviously. And uh, I occasionally use Twitter to tweet things I think are interesting, Eric underscore Brewer. But, um, you know, at the moment, because of the work I'm doing largely at Google and the work I do in developing countries, I'm actually not publishing that much directly on these topics. In fact, the CAP 12 was the last paper I wrote that was directly on this area, although I do meet with students and I've certainly advised a lot of different people, Google included. But I do hope I'll be able to publish the stuff I'm working on at Google and then not too distant. We will definitely link to CAP 12 in the show notes, and there is a page on the University of California's website which lists many of your publications. I don't know if it's all of them, but it's a, certainly a pretty big number of publications that are listed there. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. Sounds great. Thank you. So Eric Brewer, uh, it's been great having you. Thank you very much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. My pleasure. For our listeners, we would love to hear back from you about 
what you like or don't like about an episode or the show in general, you can go to iTunes and write a review. You can leave a comment on our blog. Hit us on Twitter, at SC Radio, or find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Google+. Plus. Search for Software Engineering Radio. For Software Engineering Radio, this has been Robert Blumen. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support.